announced his commitment to passing a 2% property tax cap that was a cornerstone of his 2010 campaign. Currently, the state Senate has passed the governor's bill. The Assembly Democrats have yet to take it up. However, they are calling for further negotiations on the property tax cap, but this is something that the Senate Republicans say will just weaken the measure, and they are not interested. So joining us tonight to debate the merits of the cap itself are two people who have opposing views of this particular argument. Arguing for a particular a cap tonight, and if I say cap tonight, it sounds like arguing for the show, but she is not. She's arguing for the cap space tonight is Heather Bruschetti. She's the acting president of the State Business Council. And then across the table from her is Ron Deutsch. You know him. He is the executive director of New Yorkers for Fiscal Fairness. Thank you very much for coming Thank in, you. both of you. Um, I think I just want to start by having you. I feel like I should flip a coin, but since it's not really a death match, we won't do that. I'll just, I'll, I'll let you go first. Okay. Um, because ladies don't need to really, you don't not need always. the leg up. Just state your position, if you would. Okay, well, we have been uh, an anti-cap group. We don't support the property tax cap at all. We believe that what we should be looking at is a circuit breaker. Uh, we don't believe that school, school districts don't pay property taxes, municipalities don't pay property taxes. It's individuals that pay property taxes. And while the governor and uh, Senator Skelos have clearly articulated the problem and done so well that people are being taxed out of their homes, uh, the solution that they're providing does nothing to solve that problem. So okay. if I can't pay my property taxes now and you cap them and they continue to rise, how is that going to help me? Okay, just explain briefly what a circuit breaker is. So a is. circuit breaker is a way that you link your property taxes to your income. So you should never pay more than a certain percentage of your income in property taxes. And if you do, you basically get a rebate through the income tax system. So you basically, we write off our property taxes on our income tax statement. So it's an easy calculation for the Department of Tax and Finance to make. So that if you pay too much of your income in property taxes, like hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers paying double-digit percentages of their income in property taxes, you would get a rebate. So similar to the STAR rebate program, but much more focused, much more targeted. And, um, by the way, it costs money. And it costs okay. money. So, and Heather, you can't you... do property tax relief cheap. Okay, true, because property tax, of course, is the main source of revenue for many of these districts and for local governments. State your position, but also if you would like to talk about the, yeah, why I the circuit breaker. Um, first ahead. off, I'd like to say I would be happy to come on in support of CAP tonight, if, <laughs> if that's helpful. <laughs> um, but we strongly support a property tax cap. Um, we believe fundamentally it's about job growth in the state. New York State is the worst, has been you know, publicly acknowledged and recognized as the worst tax climate in the country. One of the reasons for it is we have excessively high local real property taxes. Um, and we believe that the only way to control the rate of increase of local real property taxes is to cap it. Now, would we like 0%? Absolutely. But the governor's tax proposal, the 2% increase, which is modeled after the Massachusetts tax cap, um, is, is a very, very good first step in the right direction. And, um, you know, the Senate did pass the governor's bill already. Um, we're encouraged by that, and we'd like to see the Assembly do the same. We believe that if you control the rate of property tax increases at 2%, it will, number one, send a message to people who are thinking about leaving the state and taking jobs with them, or vice versa, um, because businesses, too, pay real property taxes, um, and that, that the state is serious about getting its fiscal house in order. So it's about jobs, fundamentally. Um, the circuit breaker, we believe, is extremely problematic because it costs money, so you need to go find revenue to pay for it. Um, it also only alleviates property taxes for a select group of people, while a cap benefits everyone, including businesses. And STAR, which what Ron mentioned, um, did not include businesses. So the net result or the effect of the STAR rebates were local real property taxes continued to grow, the residents got a break, but the, the businesses didn't. Right. So I would suggest that not everybody is paying too much in property taxes. As a matter of fact, when it comes to businesses, we look at businesses like GE and IBM that are members of the Business Council. Um, they aren't even paying taxes in, you know, whether we're talking about corporate franchise tax or uh, various uh, income-based taxes. We just had a whole expose on GE and the fact that they have these armies of lawyers that are finding, you know, using tax haven, offshore tax havens, using loopholes in the well, tax wait, law. Wait, wait, hold on. But, but are they paying property bring, taxes? Let, let's bring it back to you're property taxes. mixing tax. up two right, different right. kinds of tax. So let's bring yes. it back to property taxes. <laughs> okay. Speaking of armies of lawyers. 
<laughs> so we know that IBM and GE, for instance, have been fighting their property tax assessments. Uh, and they have these armies of lawyers that are just wearing down local uh, municipalities to the point where they just throw up their hands and give up and say, yeah, we'll that's, reduce your assessment. I mean, that's, you know, it's simply not true. Businesses pay more than 40 percent of the real property taxes in the state. The largest real property taxpayer in the state is one of my members and is a utility. And by the way, it's, it's, it's not a coincidence that we have some of the highest electric rates in the country because more than 26 or 27 percent of your electric bill is state added taxes and government added taxes including local real property taxes. The largest property taxpayer in the city of New York is a utility. It is okay. a business. Con Stop. Uh, con, probably Con Ed. Con Ed, right? Okay. Yes? Okay. So I, we don't want to name... Not supposed to re reveal sorry, we're not supposed to, we're not so. naming names here. But, yeah. but let's just bring you back to the cap because uh, we could debate whether or not it's appropriate for businesses to pay property taxes should they be debating their property taxes. They're, you're talking about challenging assessments, right? right. Okay. This is not about corporate, um, good corporate responsibility or corporate neighborliness. The question is, is a cap effective? And so one thing that we have seen on this show, we've discussed it, and I think I've actually discussed it with you and with Brian Sampson from, from Unshackle Upstate, who's probably more in line with you, yes. ideologically speaking, is the cap that the governor is seeking will not go into effect immediately. And so we are seeing school districts, some of them, start to talk about putting forward budgets that will raise taxes, correct? And without mandate relief, others argue, there is not going to be uh, a possibility for districts to actually remain solvent. So what to do about that particular thing? We'll start with you. Well, I would suggest that what's happening right now is the tax cap is another way of Albany kind of passing the buck down to the local level. And Albany has also just, for instance, just let's take schools, for instance, right? Schools are getting a major cut this year. We're talking $1.2 billion in cuts to schools. And schools obviously need revenue in order to continue to provide the services that they're providing to students. Um, so unfortunately, what's going to happen is with a tax cap, schools are going to be squeezed even more. And they won't be able to go to local property taxpayers to get money. And they're not going to be go able to go to the state to get money. So what's going to happen? We're going to see a tremendous reduction in services or cuts to teachers. Uh, cuts really across the board that are going to have a damaging impact on educational services. Okay, and Heather, isn't in this bill, before, before you get there, isn't in this bill the, uh, the allowing of people to actually vote to blow the cap, That's right? correct. The, the voters will have the opportunity to override the cap if they feel that the alternative is not something that well, they want to live no with. what if sticks to it at all? What's the well, we think that would it? be unfortunate, but we think starting off with um, I, I think at, your, at the starting gate, having a cap being the beginning of the conversation and then doing an analysis of what you can afford is a much more realistic approach. What, what we're dealing with now is there's an assumption that if you cut state funding, the local governments will raise real property taxes without really thoughtfully looking at are there other areas where they can cut spending or control spending. We do agree strongly with the governor's you know, I think vocal statement a few weeks ago that we're talking about 2.9 percent on average. Um, that's not a huge cut. 2.9 percent in, in savings. In any, businesses have been forced to, to live within these cuts. Um, there are school districts locally who are finding ways now in anticipation of reduced aid to do this without laying off teachers. If you look at, you know, I think it's Bethlehem, and I might be wrong about that, that the, the teachers agreed to a wage Is freeze Bethlehem? and no yeah. teachers are being laid off. You know, I think there are solutions there, but no one is going to look at those solutions unless they're forced to, because it's much easier to say, we'll just continue spending. And that's the experience we've had in this state. Okay, before you do not, do not, because I, <laughs> I hear you wanting to say, but actually the cuts are very much, are very deep, which is also a, a debate for another day. I do want to ask the question this, uh, this particular question. The governor yesterday suggested that he might be open to watering down the plan uh, on a tax cap, and that would be calling, saying, admitting that it's too strict to pass the Assembly Democrats, not ideologically too strict. And that would be the idea about, and, and there's some question as to exactly what he meant here, but uh, that lawmakers might be mischaracterizing what he said. However, there are exemptions in the cap. Mm -hmm. There are things that do not, to which the cap does not apply. If, in fact, those exemptions were broadened, would that be something that you think you could support? 
you know, again, we don't support the cap as a policy measure, but if there is going to be a cap, I would suggest there needs to be exceptions to the cap and exemptions to the cap. Such so, as such what? as pensions, such as health care. A lot of sometimes these costs are outside of a school district's control. Uh, sometimes the state is the one responsible for setting the costs of many of these uh, mandates that are forced upon school districts and counties. So the reality is this is just, you know, another way of Albany kind of passing that buck and abdicating its responsibility to deal with the situation at hand. Well, make no mistake about it. We support the property tax cap and we support mandate relief as one of the tools that needs to be available to local governments to be able to live within the cap. Um, I think we were very happy with the governor's proposal as, as it was presented. If, it, if there needs to be negotiation around the edges to get it through, we'll t you know, we, we think that um, we're willing you know, to support something that is slightly watered down with an eye towards addressing the underlying issue, pension costs. The reason why pensions are one of the items that people would seek to exempt from it is because they are such a huge burden on local governments. We need to look at pension reform. You know, is, should we be going to a defined uh, contribution system instead of defined benefit? Um, you know, another conversation for another day, but, but there are a lot of um, areas where we could improve the cost of the local governments through mandate relief, through looking at pension reform, uh, looking at consolidation. There's a lot of other options that are out there. Okay, so unfortunately we're out of time. However, I do want to say that on pension relief, we are going to talk about that again. We're going to bring some folks in on either side of the issue. What's helpful about this is obviously you can hash out what people feel on two philosophical sides of an argument, and you can see why it's so difficult for the legislature actually to come to some kind of agreement. The governor says he's making it a priority, and he's going to go on a campaign for it, so we will see if that is successful. Perhaps you can protest that, Ron. I'm just saying. I Far be it from me. <laughs> Ron Deutsch, thank you very much for being Thank here you. and also Heather Braschetti. Thank, Thank you. you.